So hello Tracy, uh, thank you for uh, joining in uh, on my new podcast that uh, I have started. So I've invited you uh, as the first guest on it. So I welcome you. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. It's good to see you in person <laughs> and, um, and have a nice chat with you. I'm, yeah. I'm thrilled to be here. Okay. So, okay, to begin with, uh, why don't you tell us about yourself, uh, like uh, where are you from originally and uh, how did you like uh, get into uh, street painting, what was, how was your journey up till now, since you have like uh, spent quite a, lo quite a lot of time uh, doing uh, street art all over the world, so it would be like interesting to know uh, how did you begin and how the journey has been so far. Sure, okay. Um, again, uh, my name is Tracy Lee Stum. I am uh, currently living in California. I'm originally from the East Coast of the United States, um, Pennsylvania, near Philadelphia. And um, I have been an artist all my life. I went to private art classes when I was a youth and then transitioned into art college after high school. I uh, earned a BFA in painting and drawing from Tyler School of Art, which is part of Temple University in Philadelphia. And um, once I finished my BFA, I wasn't sure if I wanted to continue in a master's program. So I, I decided to go out in the world and, and start working and you know developing um, life experiences, so to say. So I wound up in New York for about five years. Um, I was a visual merchandising director at that time. I was handling retail stores and the design and decor of those locations. And that was a really fun job for me, but I realized that I really enjoyed making images. So I was painting during the, the night and the weekends and, and showing my work, but I was also doing this job during the day. And um, at one point I quit working for other people and decided to start my own business as a mural painter or decorative painter. That led me to moving or relocating to California and, you know, things were very good for me out here. I wound up painting a lot of artwork at um, commercial uh, establishments, a lot of Las Vegas casinos, a lot of resorts and hotels and things for Disney and all over the place. And then uh, during the course of that career trajectory, I discovered street painting kind of by accident in Santa Barbara. I was there visiting um, my boyfriend at the time, who's from Santa Barbara, and we were at the mission and I saw all these, you know, thousands of people milling around the mission. I said, what's going on over there? And he said, it's a street painting festival. So I said, let's go check it out. I walked over and I couldn't believe what I saw. I saw several hundred artists making these amazing masterpieces with chalk pastel on the ground for this festival. It's like a three day event. And as soon as I saw it, I thought, oh my gosh, that's kind of what I'm doing with paint, except I'm doing it on the ceilings and the walls. So I, I'd like to try that. <laughs> and right. I was so, you know, excited about it that I figured out how to, I connected with the festival director, I got a sponsor and I participated the next year okay. from the first time. And, um, you know, it was kind of uh, a jolt to the system in that I, as an artist working in a studio, am isolated and not around the public. But this art form is practiced in a public venue, this time in front of uh, a giant uh, old mission church with a big parking lot and, you know, thousands of people coming by talking to you. And so the stress of that working in a public forum and trying to get my job done, you know, in three days was, was like, oh my gosh, can I do this? And it was chalk pastel on pavement. And I had never done chalk pastel on pavement. I had done it on paper um, throughout my college, you know, uh, time at, at school, but nothing like this and nothing of this scale with chalk. But I found out after the first weekend that I absolutely loved it and I wanted to do more of it. So that subsequently led to other invitations to other festivals. Back then, we only had about four or five festivals in the United States. Mm -hmm. And um, there, were, there were maybe like two or three festivals in Europe at that time. So it was very limited where we could practice. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, here you can't just go and practice on the street because you need a permit and the authorities will shut you down, that kind of thing. So I was always waiting for the next festival. And, um, 
you know, just kind of said to myself, well, this is so much fun. I would love to do this as my full-time job. Mm. And I started thinking about that. And I put up a website early on, probably around uh, 2000. I started street painting in 1998. Around 2000, I put up a website and just showcase work, say, hey, this is what I do. And started getting calls from people to come and street paint at events and uh, functions. So that's kind of how it started. And I've been doing it for, gosh, now, you know, 23 years. Okay. It's been a wild ride. <laughs> yeah, 23 yeah. years is a, a long time. Yeah. So uh, very interesting. Uh, your journey has been uh, very interesting. Uh, like myself, uh, you're an accidental street painter. So uh, so listening to you, like uh, since you moved from uh, uh, like what I uh, what I like to say is like it is uh, traditional uh, way of painting like uh, artists do it in their studios and then there is uh, this uh, relatively new form of painting or uh, not new but uh, like uh, a revived new uh, form of painting that's street art so uh, since you've transitioned from uh, uh, studio painting to uh, street painting so uh, uh, I mean, uh, what uh, what do you what what, uh, uh, what do you think uh, is uh, what what do you think is difference between uh, both practices? Like uh, how uh, like what do you enjoy about it more? Like street painting, what do you enjoy about it? And uh, uh, so tell us about the differences, like. Uh, when you were working as a studio artist and now that you are working as a full-time street painter or you interact with public in uh, public spaces. So how different uh, the experiences are? Well, um, I find that the actual creation or work involved with both practices are about the same. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you have to do research about your piece. You have to design your piece figure out how to execute it and then do that. The, the main differences are, as I uh, mentioned earlier, is the fact that you're creating your artwork in a public forum. So that becomes uh, about the process. Uh, it's a performance-based process at that point. In the studio, like I said, I, I, you know, somebody comes to visit me or I have assistants, they're the only people that get to see that. They see the finished product. Most people just see the finished product. But in street painting, they witness the entire process from the very first line you draw to the finished mark that you make. And, and they also get to witness um, the fragility of this art form. If you're practicing with chalk pastels, which is the traditional way to make street paintings, it's deteriorating the minute you put down the mark. So there's a quality to the process that is very much um, alive and vibrant. It's constantly evolving and changing. So, you know, you're dealing with things that you don't normally deal with in the studio where, you know, if I step on this thing that I've just drawn, it's going to start wearing away. And how do I manage that? The ephemeral nature is something that really appeals to me because I find that I don't have to hold on to something in the end. You know, I've created this drawing. It's, it's on the street and I basically offer it up to the public to kind of take ownership of it you know, I'm, I've participated up to my limit. Now I'm going to hand it over to the public and they can interact with it, destroy it, play with it, whatever they're going to do. So that to me is very special because you, it, it has a very short lifespan. It's not something you can go back to and see perfectly pristine as it was a week ago. It's going to be gone. So the, the opportunity to see one of these um, completed in the moment is, is unique and special and um that that offering up of the creative process to me is also very special so um it's really taught me how to let go i don't hold on to my art making anymore i'm not someone who's very precious with my paintings or the things i create i i can make them but i know it's part of this longer journey that i am on and um you know it's it's I think that's the main difference, really. I do still make uh, permanent pieces. And of course, I, I, I make them upon request or as needed with paint. 
things like that. But those two will eventually become destroyed because of the wear and tear. So um, I think that shortened lifespan of the paintings or the pieces are, appeals to me quite a bit. Okay, very interesting. Um, okay, so since we are now talking about uh, the processes involved uh, in creation of an artwork, so since you have, the, you have like spent uh, almost 23 years uh, uh, doing street painting all over the world and you are one of the most renowned uh, street artists uh, around the world. So uh, my question is, uh, is there like uh, a particular uh, art philosophy do you have? Like what is your process when you are uh, designing uh, or uh, when you're in the design phase and then later we'll come to the execution part, but when you're designing uh, an artwork or thinking about it, when you're coming up with the idea. So is there a particular philosophy that you follow? Like uh, this is a must have in my works. Uh, or uh, like it's totally uh, general, like uh, you design according to like uh, the context or if uh, you follow a particular brief that's given on some occasions, like we're working for clients, so they give us the brief. So what is your design process like? Is there a particular philosophy that you follow? Um, I pro there, there are some things that I pay attention to when I'm designing or coming up with my uh, concepts. I have made a practice of tuning into or paying attention to things that come to me while I'm not even making art. And if an idea pops into my head, I jot it down. I make a note of it. And then eventually I wind up having a long list of ideas that I've accumulated over the course of time. And I will oftentimes go back to that list and search for concepts that may be appropriate for the particular project I'm working on. I am an intuitive artist in that I do receive creative impulses all the time, no matter what I'm doing, especially when I'm relaxing, if I'm walking or, or doing something non-art related, I get all these downloads of ideas. And if I've had a good night's sleep, I'll wake up with like five ideas and I write them down. So um, I don't know where that comes from. That's probably just being very um, uh, subconsciously open to mm -hmm. the larger creative field, let's say. Mm -hmm. And so those things kind of download into me and I pay attention to those. So I write them down and I say, okay, this might be a good idea. But I do like to make sure that my pieces have um, a believable uh, functionality when it comes to interaction. I also like to include a, a sense of humor or lightness in my pieces because I want people to enjoy them. Mm -hmm. And I want them to bring out the playful nature in, in the person who's experiencing the artwork. You know, we, we, we are all um, a kind of actors or performers in, deep down inside. We're children. And I'm trying to tap into that inner child so that people can be free about expressing themselves when they're interacting with the art. You know, it's about a surprise. It's about um, the unexpected. It's about um, discovery and perception, the way we see the world. So I, I, I offer up those questions, but I do it in a very um, open and playful manner. And I think that's really important for me as an artist. That's, that's what resonates with me. I like to bring light into my pieces um, through, you know, through a positive experience. So um, I know that's probably not very stylish or fashionable now. There's a lot of propaganda art out there that people are going after and, and pursuing, and that's great for them. But for me, I've always been a person that wants to, I want to touch that five-year-old as well as the 85-year-old. So um, I try to keep my pieces in that realm. Okay, great, great. So, uh, okay, since uh, uh, for the last uh, if last year or so, a year and a half, uh, the world has, uh, you know, uh, suddenly changed uh, due to uh, COVID-19. So how do you think uh, it has uh, affected your art practice and uh, then art practice in general? Like uh, since we are into street painting, so how, do, how has it affected? uh street painting and what do you think uh, will be the future of uh, this art form 
uh, where do you uh, see this headed in light of covid since uh, since it's not uh, going away very soon and we have to adapt with it so uh, where do you uh, see this as headed well from my own personal experience and the and the observations i've made of my friends and colleagues and peers you know the last year was a year of you know, isolation and uh, restriction. So I saw a lot of people turning towards um, furthering their education by online courses, turning to digital practices and increasing and enhancing their digital practices. Um, a lot of people that weren't artists before or weren't actively practicing art are now practicing art because of that isolation, which I think is tremendous. And so, you know, people are really tapping into their creativity. As far as the restrictions go, you know, street painting definitely saw um, a halt last year uh, when it comes to the festivals where we practice. Uh, a lot of the festivals went online. So mm. people were drawing on their driveways or their sidewalks or things like that where they had access that was close to their home. So they didn't have to interact with the public and posting those those photos online so it was like a virtual festival which is kind of cool and um so that everything is now on social media and online platforms youtube you can see videos those kind of things uh, for me personally i spent the year uh, working quietly behind the scenes on um my my last most recent project which is my own new museum tilt museum yeah. And so that required, it actually worked out perfectly for me because it required a lot of time on the design, the architectural plans, the layout, the con conceptualizing of the museum, the details, all of those things that go into the creating of a space like that, which I'd say the bulk of that work is comprises probably 65 to 70% of the total work of that project. So I was doing that last year. You know, working at a drawing table, working on my computer, making models, things like that, um, and preparing for the artwork that I was going to be creating this year. So as far as the future goes with the restrictions, I think that there will continue to be socially distanced events that will continue to be virtual. Um, there are street painters still practicing, but of course, it's not as... Um, engage with the public because you have to have a space around you and it's not quite the same it's like you'll see a beautiful picture online but there's no one around it so it's mm -hmm. kind of like well you know we can appreciate it this way now and um, you know as far as as far as how this is going to play out in the end I'm just hoping that things will eventually start to normalize over the next two years or so and we start to see people coming back to maybe more restrictive practices with public street painting. But uh, again, I think um, this has caused a lot of people to go into the studio, start creating things that are studio based and digitally based. And that's what I've ob observed. Right. Uh, since you may, uh, mentioned uh, your most recent project, uh, that is a museum that uh, you recently opened. So uh, tell us about uh, the idea behind it. Like, uh, have, have you been uh, working on it for a while or uh, since I mentioned COVID, so uh, because of COVID, was it fast track or uh, was it uh, happening before COVID happened? And uh, then uh, how did you like uh, think of the pieces and what was uh, the whole idea behind it? Like, uh, interestingly, the name that you have come up with, uh, Tilt Museum. So what's the idea behind the name as well? And uh, tell us about what the future will be for the museum. Like, will you be like uh, renewing the artworks every year or so or and uh, since it, it, it has opened recently. So how has the response been uh, of the public so far? Okay, uh, let's see. This idea for a museum originated back in, my goodness, 2009, mm. um, when I was approached by my current management team and they had come up with an idea to create a 3D museum in Las Vegas. 
And um, I, right around that time, around 2010, I had gone to China, to Hong Kong, and had done a mini museum called Illusion House. And that we only put about five or six illusions in this uh, interactive uh, kind of uh, environment with vignettes. And the response was tremendous. And people were lining up to see that for hours. It was crazy. So there was interest there from the public. Um, we got back to the United States and unfortunately couldn't find any um, investors or partners that, that could see the value of this idea. So I had to sit on it for a long time. Yeah, it's <laughs> and you know, so I sat on it and I actually watched other people doing it in Asia, you know, and um, coming up with these museums. I thought, OK, they're 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 doing it. And <laughs> we we really want to do it, too. So um, anyway, I just thought, well, maybe this will happen. Maybe it won't. I wasn't that super attached to it. But um, the opportunity arose uh, with, to partner with American Dream, which is the uh, entertainment and retail facility where the museum is located. And um they, because they are so strongly invested in entertainment and attractions, they were very intrigued by the idea. So my team and I pitched the idea to them and they said, yes, we would like to pursue this. So it, a partnership was born out of that. And um, that was in 2019. And so I've been slowly and quietly working on this for the last, you know, two and a half years. And um Let's see, gosh, we started with the name, right? We came up with the name Tilt, a Tracy Lee Stum Museum. Um, the reason we chose Tilt is because of the idea of skewing or tilting your point of view. You know, when you walk into one of these 3D museums or, you know, illusion museums, you'll see artwork that looks very strange and is skewed and distorted and you're not sure what it is. And oftentimes you have to turn your camera or rotate the image or things like that. So we thought Tilt was a good fit for that. And we tested, we actually tested the name and the name was getting some very good feedback. So we decided to go with that. Um, I don't just make arbitrary decisions. I always work with a team and do research to figure out how this is going to play out. And certainly a marketing plan or a business plan about the success of the museum is super important as well. So we, we did our homework and we figured out that, um, you know, we could, we could actually achieve what we wanted in this space. So I was handed a 7,000 square foot space by the, the facility and they said, come up with an idea, come up with a design. So I spent a year working on that and figuring out the best configuration for traffic flow, how many guests could we have in there at the same time, what are the restrictions, the permitting, the coding, all of those things I had to learn about. Um, which was a lot of fun for me because I was working with some really amazing design teams. Gensler was the designer on the project and the architects for that. Um, um, American Dream has a very good reputation for providing quality attractions. So I felt very confident with the team that I was working with. And um, I would say for the designing of the artwork, you know, my concept for that was that I wanted a wide variety of content that was um, rooted in popular um, appeal, but also pushing the boundaries a little bit and pri providing and creating new ways to look at um, old topics, let's say. Mm -hmm. So each, each design in the museum is completely unique. We don't really have a theme there, but we wanted to capture, you know, nature. We wanted to capture animals. They're very popular. We wanted to capture abstractions. We wanted to capture, um, you know, vignettes and all kinds of concepts that anyone from any age could relate to. So um, I invited in um, six of my friends who are fellow professional street painters. I actually wanted to invite many more, but because of the COVID restrictions, I couldn't get people from overseas to come, which was really unfortunate. Yeah. Um, but we turned that into a, a bonus by bringing the some of the best American street painters and, and from Mexico to the project. So uh, they came and participated by contributing one or two pieces each. So we have a total of 26 illusions in the museum. And um, I'm very pleased with the way it turned out. There, it's, it's got a nice flow. It feels good. There's different artworks of different for different age demographics. Um, you know, little kids to adults really love it. So far, the response has been tremendous. Families really love it. Mm -hmm. um, teenagers really love it. Um, I'd say, you know, 99% of the people coming out of there from my experience absolutely 
are in love with the space. They come up to me and they tell me, we had a great time. We love the artwork. It's just a unique offering. So, um, you know, the New York area doesn't really have a, a facility like this. So this is the first of its kind in the New York area. And I think people are really responding because they want to get out of the house. They want to do something. They want to go see something. Um, the museums are opening up now. There are, um, they don't really have public events happening in the New York area, you know, with large gatherings, but you can still go see some of these things and that are culturally based. And I think people are really responding to that very well. So probably not the wisest decision to open a museum during a pandemic <laughs> lockdown, but yeah, I think that it's got a lot of room to grow and I'm very excited to see how this will transform in the next six months to a year. And as, as to your question about how we plan on keeping the museum alive and vibrant, which is a, a big concern for me, um, my plan is to uh, change out the artwork on a periodic basis. You know, every like six to nine months, we'll start changing out a few pieces to keep it fresh. We do have um, planned an artist residen residency component to the museum where we will invite international artists to come over and create maybe uh, one to three pieces each person. Mm -hmm. They'll have a dedicated space. They could do whatever they want with it, as long as it's illusion oriented. Mm -hmm. And um, once we get that off the ground, once pandemic restrictions are lifted somewhat, then we can start pursuing that. But one of the other components that makes us unique in the, in the 3D museum uh, arena is that we are opening, um, we have a workshop maker space in the museum that we'll be conducting workshops around art making, uh, illusions, all kinds of um, offerings that will range from workshops for children to workshops for adults. Uh, we will be having um, birthday party events there. You, you know, people can basically rent out the museum for events and parties and things like that. Uh, so we're trying to make the space as versatile as possible to keep it exciting for visitors they want to come back again and again to see what we're doing so that's that's a a large part of the success i think of the space and that's what i'm concentrating on right now is getting those plans developed and off the ground so like i said it's been a little bit challenging during covid because of um the limitation on the number of guests that can actually come to the space come to the to the complex itself you know, but um, I see hopefully by the summertime, New York City is going to be opening up 100% so that we can start having more guests. That's yeah. wonderful. wonderful. Uh, very uh, good to know that uh, how we've come up with the idea and how it's going and the future plans. So uh, I think I'm going to ask you uh, the last question now and uh, then we can like wrap it up. So my last question would be like, uh, can you name like two or three artists, uh, not necessarily street painters, but uh, um, more importantly, like those who are doing creative practices uh, that uh, who inspire you or whose work uh, works are different. They're not uh following what uh, the trends are they're doing something different and like pushing the limits and uh, with this same question i have a sub question as well or more like uh, uh i would like uh, what kind of advice would you give to anyone like who's uh, getting into street painting or street art or art in general so uh, what would be your like Mm, uh, short advice for them. Sure. Uh, yeah, there are several artists that I'm following right now who I absolutely think are amazing. Uh, one is Rafiq Anadol. Mm -hmm. He is a digital artist operating out of Los Angeles. Um, he was on the faculty of UCLA, mm -hmm. but he, he's got a company where he creates, he creates digital, um, um, large scale digital pieces that are created from collection of data and tracking of um, digital data through um, his, com his computer systems and his programs. And they create these incredible um, optical illusions of, you know, lar super large scale, like two or three story high installations of digital screens with these incredible moving pieces. And I, I just, 
think it's insane what they're doing. <laughs> These artists are now using computers to, to, to generate artwork that is just, it's unique. And I absolutely love it. I think it's fantastic and can't wait to see where this takes us. So I'm following um, artists like him as well online. And I also find, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm always, I've always been big on following contemporary art trends. And I recently saw a show by Julie Maretu at the Whitney Museum in New York. And her work is just astounding. Her process is incredibly um, uh, layered and, and just meticulous. And her pieces are, are they just draw you in. They're, they're monu monumental pieces. And a lot of thought going into the concept behind her reactions or her um, responses to things that are going on in society today. Mm -hmm. So I, her work is very different. Uh, both of these artists are very different from what I do, but uh, that's what turns me on. I like seeing the differences in, in the styles and the approaches to art making. Um, and I would have to say for young artists um, who want to come up and try something different, this is the time to do it. You know, this is the, 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 the we are in an environment now where making um, new uh, inroads into untried practices or new ideas is what it's all about. This is, this is the time to do it. So if you have a unique idea or a unique concept or something that's not been done before, go for it, do it, just pursue it. It will, if, if you are committed to it, you will find a way to make it uh, manifest, let's say. So um, just have confidence in yourself you know, there's, there's, um, there's no judgment in art. Art is, you know, it's, it's a, it's a practice that's personal for each of us. So I say, just pursue what you have interest in, in what you have passion in, what fulfills you. Um, and for me personally, I, I'm excited to see what young people come up with or new artists come up with. I'm always curious about where the, the entire, um, uh, you know, world of art or the, 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 the arena of art is headed. So I, I want to see that. And, you know, I, that inspires me. I mean, I almost feel like I'm old school compared to a lot of these people <laughs> that are coming up and I think it's great. I mean, I, I love what they're doing. So um, it keeps me excited and invigorated with what, with my practice. So um, that's the best advice I can give them. Right, right, right. With that, uh, I would like to, you know, thank you for, you know, taking out uh, time and, uh, you know, talking to me. To me. It was really uh, nice listening to you about your journey and uh, your newest creation and your process. So thank you very much. And uh, hopefully we can uh, connect in future as well and, uh, you know, talk about more uh, i have had more questions but uh, since we have like time constraint so sure. we can uh, you know have uh, we can do it some other time again so thank you very much thank you thank you so much for having me and yes let's do a part two and i do hope we get to actually see each other somewhere at event uh -huh. in the near future <laughs> yeah. okay okay thank okay, you thanks thank you thanks so much. Ben. i really appreciate it yeah, yeah likewise thank you